that we're going to buy two more. So he'll have backups now. Right. Thank you. All right, Carl, um, I have started the presentation, and you can... Okay. Let's start. If you can't hear Carl, I'd suggest moving up, because he's on a computer. It Go should for. be okay. I said with him. Oh, well, I'm talking volume-wise. Um, let me just go ahead and adjust that here. How's this? Can you hear? Yes. We're good? All right, go forward. Hi. Hi, good morning. Carl Kaufman here. Uh, talking here uh, this morning. And, uh, uh, nope, you're you breaking up now. Me? Carl? Yes. Whatever adjustment you made screwed up your volume. So. Let's try that again. All right, let me just go ahead and check on that. I don't have any. It's a good thing we ran through All this right, earlier. Let me check on this Could be because I'm everybody's now on the computer. Part. Yeah, I'm just looking right here. Uh, let me just go and check. I'm going to check my system resources. It could be my bandwidth, Carl. Yeah, I'm checking right here. You know, it wouldn't be a tech conference unless there was at least a small little glitch. So I'm posting out some applications right now. Oh, thank you. That might help a little. All right, how's this? Sounds good. <laughs> Go for it. Surprising thing. Well, I I think it says not surprisingly. New York Times was one of the biggest three for talks. <laughs> Bad New York Times. <laughs> Well, I think that's one of the things that's been talking about up front of the web performance. A lot of media types now, there's been enough that's put in this listing for ad networks. They really eat up a lot of the system resources. It's not the content itself. Okay. So let's get started. And I'm going to say um, slow down your speech a little bit, only because of the lag time with Join Me. It's just a slight lag. Ready? Let me check on mouse control. I don't seem to have mouse control anymore. Hold on. Let me give it back to you. back again. Um, let me just check this. I guess we could start at 9.30. Are you using the keyboard? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I've got a keyboard. Let me just see. I'm using the keyboard right here. All right. Okay. You use the keyboard. Let me see. Is this going up? Okay, okay. so we got to get started. Okay. Let, let's go. Hi, uh, good morning. Hi, uh, good morning. Welcome to Drupal Camp Florida. I'm uh, Carl Kaufman. I'm a designer and a Drupalist here in the DC area, and I'm uh, working together with Kirsten on Comic-Con. Um, as far as becoming a user advocate, um, this is often overlooked when it comes down to web development. But as Don Norman and Jacob Nielsen of Nielsen Norman Group point out, that it encompasses all aspects of the end user's interaction with the company, its services, and its products. This also comes down to web design and development, and oftentimes uh, when we think about user experience, it isn't necessarily beautiful, but it's functional. The main thing is focusing on can the user get the task done that they need to when they're on your web presence. That includes oftentimes the administrative backends and space we build in Drupal. Uh, a little bit about us, uh, about Kirsten, uh, if you want to introduce yourself. 
So I'm just a govy. I uh, work at the U.S. Department of State and um, founded a small group, which we, we affectionately refer to as Drupal for Gov. And we hold a, an annual conference called Drupal GovCon. Your turn, Carl. And about, <laughs> about me, um, I'm primarily a visual designer. I do print branding and web design. Um, I moved from print to web design, and of course, the, our, a number of projects often have, have multiple apps in the ring that includes information architecture, and I was I'm helping out with World IA Day yesterday here in DC, and also with content strategy. In addition to this, and how I got to know person is being involved on major Drupal projects for government clients, and that includes site building and architecture, uh, sometimes having to pick up projects midstream. As far as user experience, as I mentioned before, especially with the quote from the Wilson Army Group, it encompasses everything we do. And if we're not meeting the needs of our users, uh, we're primarily missing what we are uh, tasked to do. And uh, that, of course, can impact not only the users, but our bottom line as well. Whether our projects are successful or not, we'll be called on for new tasks. As far as the value proposition for user experience, uh, aligning the goals uh, with the, uh, your organizational goals with users uh, enhances your ability to fulfill its mission. It enables users to more quickly achieve their goals and empower greater community engagement. I mean, some of the best brands in the world, and I know some people may knock Apple, but one of the things that leads to Steve Jobs uh, was still with Tom. Uh, he had an instinctive knowledge uh, of what users would need, even if the users didn't know themselves. And I came down to building strong brand with both with Apple. Uh, also, other companies that may come to mind that uh, comes in here, for example, of Airbnb and Uber, even, uh, use a very effective user experience. Granted, it came into markets that had been long established and uh, had some sort of older paradigms here, which no longer serve very well. Uh, having apps that are very responsive, for example, minimizing a lot of calls to support because a lot of needs have already been accounted for the user experience, the research, and well uh, and performed the web design. It uh, goes a long way to help you with this. Uh, one of the common misconceptions that's often in the field is that user experience does not equal user interface. User interface is only one, uh, basically the visual uh, part of the user experience. As kind of an analogy to that, I think of it as food. You start out with the content, which is the raw material. The user inter uh, interface are only the utensils we use. User experience goes to whole dining experience. Uh, it's sort of like the tip of the iceberg. A lot of what is talking about this user experience, uh, generally, as we look at the visual, which should be a, a user interface. But user experience is far uh, greater. It has to do with a lot of the research, uh, whether it has to do with re uh, ethnographic or, or uh, functional, and a lot of the uh, uh, just a lot of the interactions that we normally don't think about when a user is accessing our product. Of course, coming down to that is there's so many uh, facets that this encompasses. The main thing is where we can impact design is by advocating for users. As far as the principles of UX, it may help to go over these. Oh, let me just pop that up a little bit. There was a little bit of a left. Uh, Peter Morgan uh, basically broke this down into a number of uh, facets coming up here, uh, answering a few questions. Main thing you need to be asking about your product and services, is it useful? Is it usable? Is it desirable? Is it findable? Is it accessible? Is it credible? Or is it valuable? Now we'll go into further detail on these. The uh, main thing behind it, of course, is that we need to be looking on beyond project requirements. I know this is often a challenge, and I think we've all been through before, especially when we're on a project that has a number of deadlines. And we have to basically come back here and, and look, at our, uh, look at the product from the uh, standpoint of the end user. And that's where we have to apply a lot of our experience coming into this to make it an experience for them. It's one thing to go out here and push an MVP out the door. And this is especially the case in agile workflows. The main thing we need to do is, does this MVP actually fill the minimum needs that the user would need? That, of course, is feasible. Uh, one of the things that comes down to that is this. It's necessary, but it not, off isn't sufficient, That's especially when it comes to the brand loyalty, getting people to come back, have a product that they can actually use. And even besides coming out here and having glitzy marketing campaigns that say with high value products and services, this comes down to a lot of uh, 
projects we work on a day-to-day basis. Even if it comes down to say backend tests that say a content editor or constructor may be working with, if they can find it all that useful or, or definitely that applicable, it may fulfill the basic need, but it isn't something they may be calling upon in the future or calling your services again. Uh, desirability. Now, I know this is often uh, a, is kind of a vague term. Uh, sometimes people are looking into building some type of guilt. It comes into all types of products and services. Even, for example, if it happens to be financial accounting or web analytics, uh, people actually have to be liking using it. That's why I think it comes down to good web design, and, and especially for some of the data, uh, products that actually get it. It's something like MailChimp, for example. Some of us probably to some degree or another have to be dealing with uh, email marketing. And they do it with beautiful UX uh, and, and it's actually a pleasurable experience to be working with, even if our deadline we have a lot of tasks to cover. And if it's findable. Uh, this is especially important on the web when it comes down to search engine optimization, and especially on Drupal where there are virtually limitless ways of going after you're building a project. The main thing we need to look at too is how semantic is the code? Can people find what they're looking for, not only visually, but from a code standpoint? Um, can Google plug into it pretty well? Are there other things we need to look at? If somebody is not familiar with our product or service and say, come up to it from a non-designated landing page, will they be able to find what they're looking for? Accessible. Uh, this is becoming a greater uh, issue, uh, especially when it comes down to government projects where they're mandated. But not only for that, it's good business. Google, of course, is already mandated. I think this is good that when it comes down to search uh, uh, analytics, that if your site is not accessible, it will already be gained in search ranking. And to keep in mind that this uh, that more of us, and uh, talking about on a regular basis, will have some type of accessibility issue at some time in, in, in our lives. It may be something temporarily, say that there happens to be some sort of an injury. Maybe we're in an area of low bandwidth where a lot of uh, multimedia features may not be accessible. Sometimes you may be for in a, in a time or, or situation of high cognitive load, say you're under a lot of stress that are things going on in your life or your work. Um, that's where it comes down to, there are a lot of facets to accessibility that need to be kept into account, whether it happens to be with left out or even the text and copy editing that you were using. Uh, credible, especially at this time in juncture of history, uh, we have to be uh, careful about what uh, uh, respecting for users trust and what we put out there. There are plenty of dark patterns, especially when it comes down to SEO or say pushing people for a certain marketing goal. Uh, the thing behind it is this is always keep in mind. Is this going to be some short term thing that, that will actually have a long term negative effect? People believe they're being manipulated. This is something you need to keep in, in, in your hat at all times. And valuable. One of the things, of course, is coming down here, and especially when it comes down to design and UX, is we have to be able to demonstrate value at all times. And this goes not only for for-profit, but for non-profit organizations as well, especially if it's a lot of government initiatives that are currently under the microscope. The main thing behind it is, is, is it advocating for our mission? Is it allowing our users to fulfill what they need to do? Does it fit with the mission of our, of, of our organization to begin with? As far as the process is concerned, uh, you may need to find what works best for you. I'll go over mine. Uh, design thinking has become a major uh, uh, talk about the topic, uh, and though sometimes not without controversy. I've been involved with design thinking, especially here in DC area. Uh, some of the people that I've uh, been involved with and been able to learn from to come from the Jay for D school, and also some of the uh, in house teaching that uh, I've done. The main thing behind it is it's a magic. It's just a framework from which to launch UX initiatives. The main thing behind it is it's student-centered and allows for quick iteration to a lot of on-hand future testing. I'm going to through some of the basic processes that are involved in design thinking. It generally answers four questions. Uh, what is, what if, what wows, and what works. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, my process, I've adapted a little bit here. The main thing behind it is this empathy for all project members is key. And of course, the, the uh, uh, to, uh, uh, a fear of uh, being wrong is left behind. A lot of what it comes down to is rapid iteration, and that's why it ties in well to this, um, uh, other business practices, such as agile workflows. Uh, the main thing behind it is to have something that you can have as an MVP that can be rapidly tested. 
uh, going into my phases, uh, first is discover. Uh, and the main thing is start out here, uh, finding out for, for what exactly you need to work with, is by doing use of the stakeholder interviews. That's when you need to find the actual goal, not a vague and desired result. I knew from first-hand experience, of course, that when it comes down to interviewing, especially when it comes to, uh, to users, oftentimes uh, they may not really be aware of all that they need to be covered. And I think that's where it comes only to experience, uh, sometimes by learning the hard way, of course, is uh, finding out what questions you need to answer, try to suss out what their challenges are. Also, for good, the requirements gathering. This is something that, of course, needs to be uh, there, but is much more than just going out here and building to an MVP. Also, what is key is to bring buy in from key, key stakeholders. And that's what I find is going out here and getting people involved from the outset, especially looking at uh, what Jared Spielberg referred to as executive swoop and poop. Sometimes it may even require a little bit more sleep to find out anyone who can be making a decision and having it involved to some degree or another that they don't feel left out and try to scuttle your project at a later time. As far as personas, uh, this is one thing that was also discussed at World by Day yesterday. Uh, the main thing behind it is, is I wouldn't focus on building an elaborate one. Instead, you need to have some sort of an effective archetype that you can go out here and have something that, or someone that you can advocate for. I would stress against that too, is not to spend too much time going out here building an elaborate person that's actually believable. Because part of the, uh, I would say, unconscious bias that may creep in then is you have someone that you're building this tale for made for. You may have a tailor made for this one user. It doesn't mean that it's going to be successful overall for your main target audience. As far as the tool set is concerned for the discovery, um, I just keeping this as simple as possible. I have my own questionnaires that I've adapted from online sources. Um, coming down to that, maybe interviewing aids such as recorders, it can help at times to be picking up uh, things that you may not uh, be careful about when you're record uh, when you're doing a uh, rate and recording of it yourself the old way. Um, also, when it comes down to that, what I would also suggest is, if possible, when doing your interviews, is if you can have one person doing the interviewing and another one doing the note taking. I tend to get pretty involved with that. And one of the things that can be missed out is if you're paying more attention to the recording, uh, what users are experiencing, what they're telling you, there may be a lot of unverbal cues you can be missing. Coming on to the next phase is iteration. This is where you're incorporating your research into an MVP prototype. Again, I would stress this you use low fidelity tools. Paper and whiteboard are often the best for this. And uh, one thing I know exactly from my own personal uh, uh, workflow as well, it's good to have these experts, especially when you set limited time goals. The main thing behind that is, uh, what I would stress is this, is you don't want to get too involved at this point. You just want to have something out here that you can basically use as a hypothesis to validate the assumptions you have. Is it going to work? If you can, uh, at this time, also involve stakeholders, and that's why I recommend having throwaway prototypes that can be easily validated. Even if it's something like still we're working on a group project and you have some apps you can be sketched, even if it happens to be on a paper napkin, if it's something quick and down and dirty like this that you can be discussing with people, say almost like gorilla UX as it's called. The good thing about this, you can get a lot of assumptions validated quickly. As far as the tools that are concerned, I also use my own paper templates for that. Sometimes even using fine paper may be a good whiteboard if you're on premises. The good thing about whiteboard also is this the lowest barriers to entry. So even if you're working with stakeholders, oftentimes it may be very uh, amenable to coming out here and taking a marker of their own and start coming out here and sketching their own ideas, helping with the project as part of co-creation, which I think is really good. Also for post it for the same thing. Uh, Learn fidelity tools help in this way because people don't feel that they're looking at a finished piece. They know that it's only a rough work in progress and therefore are um, are, are less inhibited about going in and uh, soliciting feedback. And, and what I would say is make sure that you're limiting your time that you have for, uh, that you are for, for forcing yourself to come up with as many possible ideas as you can. Uh, then the next stage coming into is build. This is when you're going out here and building your best prototype ideas in your product. Again, testing as often as possible. Uh, really, you have to, even if it's among members of your team that may not be that involved with the project, it's good to get some quick feedback. And of course, when it comes down to modularity, not only from the way that we build things from the iterative standpoint, but the, the way things are going with the web, uh, looking as far as you can uh, basically, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, 
processes in your uh, applications as much as possible. That extends your use, and oftentimes, even if it's change, you may have something that can be easily adapted instead of built from the ground up again. And of course, coming back to this, if you have any major issues, just to come back and uh, do more iteration, get to a point where you can fix it. That's part of where modularity helps again. You don't have to do the entire process over. You have a small step that may need to be improved. As far as the tools that are concerned, it's at this point where I would think from the code. I'm very big on the uh, concept of staying away from comps as much as possible. Try to get the medium fidelity up to code as quickly as possible. Um, some of the projects I'm working at now at my main job, which is the Fannie Mae, I have colleagues that are building a lot of prototypes with them sketch. Most of these are going to be throwaway. I spent months of work on this. It's only getting to the point now that they're actually being built by the development team inside code. And part of the challenge behind that is uh, they're using some older frameworks, such as library portal, some of you may have dealt with in the past. It has a number of limitations. They're finding out quickly what can work and what can't. If it had been moved into code more quickly, of course, this could have been validated weeks and months ago. And this is where I would also, it brings in a spirit of collaboration. And that's why I was just going back here and breaking down a lot of walls, especially when it comes down to older processes, such as waterfall. Uh, having developers and designers work together uh, that, that, that leverage their strengths. Yes, you may not expect developers to know a lot about, say, accessibility or contrast. Uh, uh, some of the more aesthetic aspects like uh, typography, uh, a lot of vertical rhythm and stuff, but they can be pointing out a lot of the challenges behind the uh, uh, processes here. Well, we can do this, which may look good visually, but how will it do performance? You can solve a lot of problems quickly when this is dealt with in this manner. And again, um, as soon as you can, it's to start testing this on a variety of devices, especially when it comes down to, uh, of course, with more access to mobile these days, Sure, we may be going out here and be technologists ourselves. We may have some good quality equipment on the high bandwidth uh, mobile plants, for example. That doesn't mean that, no, that a, a significant number of our user base has that, and that's why it's good to account for. Are they getting a decent experience? Oh, uh, that brings us to our next phase, which is review. This has come down to functional testing. Again, getting this in the hands of users and finding as much as possible. I'm sure we all know from experience, it doesn't matter how much we plan for and account for this, how many checklists we've run, uh, we may try to account for every situation, but when something is out in the field, there are things we probably never thought of, situations that people are experiencing, or we're going to find out challenges we had never anticipated. That comes, of course, to hand in hand with user testing. We can find a lot of these things pretty quickly. Security is another aspect that I cannot emphasize more strongly. I worked on some large Drupal projects for government clients. Uh, basically, what came down to is that it came to some of the more traditional design type challenges. Uh, the stakeholders were more concerned about, say, the visual presentation, the colors, the images that were used, some of the text and the uh, some of the text and the way that certain uh, items were emphasized. One of the things I got left to the side was security. Uh, for one of the projects, what happened is uh, it, it, it was basically uh, their, their target audience was for, for minority women that are in challenging life situations. Um, how the security hole was discovered this. Uh, one of these clients for this government program I just went out uh, on a uh chance, started Googling herself, found a lot of information that should have been secure. From a triple standpoint, it came down to something as simple as uh, basically the content access to one of the views, how the content was being displayed on that site. I mean, this is beautiful one-on-one. Most of us are familiar with this, but this shows that if security isn't baked in, especially for how, how important it is to keep a lot of personally identifiable information secure, not tested, how something that's such a minor issue in approval can become a major issue for clients. There was a lot of patching up that needed to be done, so I would suggest make sure that you're regularly testing for security if it's required. And that ties into your major issues to discover to look at rebuilding or, uh, or iterating before it goes out and is for final release. As far as the tool set is concerned, most of what you're working with is what you have been before. Again, accounting for a little bandwidth and other challenges and testing as much as possible, in-house, out-of-house, wherever you can. That uh, brings us down to the next stage, which is deployment. Uh, once your major requirements are successfully fulfilled, then you can be looking at launching. Again, paying attention to use it as much as possible. And granted, oftentimes, we don't know how much feedback. Sometimes you may have a silent majority you're dealing with. 
Uh, so that's what the analytics come in. Again, looking at this, if you build your system in a modular fashion, it should not be that difficult to go out here and start finding out where your trouble spots are and looking at how to improve that. Again, make sure that you have it baked into your process to reuse and uh, changes are easily uh, uh, possible to be actionable. As far as tool set is concerned, again, that has changed. I would just look into analytics. Um, unless you're working on some projects, say, such as government, where there may be security issue or, or comes down to regulations, um, if you can uh, employ analytics, and of course there are plenty of free tools out there, mainly among Google Analytics, to use that, even when it comes down to projects where it's not. Unless there's a strong issue on doing it, there are also analytics tools when it even comes down to Drupal. Even if you're looking at the system, for example, for server or site logs, um, how is your content being accessed? Is there going to be some sort of an issue with a bandwidth problem? Like that may be a time to be doing some things on the back end, talking with your, especially when it comes to DevOps. How are you going to be accounting for this? Are there any ways you can improve the process? Is this actually causing users not to be able to access your content as much as they should? And also, what I would say is one of the big takeaways to this is the process doesn't stop here. but look at continual improvement over the life of the product. As far as the project example is concerned, um, one of the major sites that I have worked on in recent years was the UXBA International uh, 2016 conference. And as far as some of the challenges were concerned with it, um, we needed to have some custom coding to interact with the main site, which is also in Drupal. Uh, part of it was the very complex uh, user authentication that was being required. Um, for some technical reasons, we couldn't uh, put this on the same domain today as Drupal Commons. That required a lot of custom uh, interactions that were designed by uh, a developer I was partnering with. Also, because it's UXBA, we've been demanding UX centric user base. Um, part of it also moving into the modern uh, era, no printed program would be used. I worked on, the, on UXB International 2015, and uh, this came down to some of the user uh, uh, feedback that we had. As soon as one item had changed on a printed program, nobody referred to it anymore because they knew it was no longer valid or believable. Uh, they had figured that other things would be changing and couldn't rely upon it anymore. That's why we needed to make sure that we would have a performance schedule that can be viewed on a wide number of devices. And also to look at it, and tying into that is a careful balance of performance and features. Um, what you're looking at here is this is the final site, looking at the home page. Uh, going from left to right, of course, is you have desktop, uh, you have tablet, you have mobile view. Part of it also is just coming after one of them have clean design. Uh, they wanted to have a very corporate feel. Um, part of it also, of course, is making sure that there wasn't going to be a graded experience for users who would be on mobile devices versus on desktop. I looked also not only into the code that we were designing, but also in the visual aspects. It's very modular. You can see here as we, uh, we worked at keeping the same experience, regardless of the format form factor, that users would be able to access the same content, not have a diminished experience. Uh, for some of this, this even included careful design of visual elements. Uh, you take, for example, hero images. Uh, these were served uh, via picture from Breakpoint to make sure that there wouldn't be a major bandwidth penalty for mobile users. Um, part of it that is early on into the process. This comes down to user centered design and stuff, a part of the UX process that often is an apparent, but mapping user flow. Part of it also was making sense because UXDA International has a very complex so registration and authentication scheme. So a lot of that came into this, for example, this is only for the user purchase. Uh, there were other flows that were mapped, uh, just showing though, not only how the user interacts, but how the different data components inside and outside of Drupal would be working with one another. Uh, this is one way you can anticipate a lot of challenges and already start to account for them before any code is even committed. Uh, data flow is another thing. As I had mentioned, uh, some of the things that we had to work with on building the internal application, say how things were linked in, um, I would say due to a lack of documentation. Um, I didn't think that uh, some of the current distributions of Drupal, such as COD, would basically be fitting our needs. So the developer and I decided from the outset to go out here and build the entire custom solution in Drupal 7 from the ground up. And this shows that some of the ways that we were going out here and working at, at building conference schedules. Um, also building in different, different elements, say, such as speakers coming in here and the event itself and how it was going to be displayed. 
it may look a little bit involved, but I think it solves a lot of the problems and uh, avoids a lot of headaches rather than going in straight into code and experimenting. Uh, site architecture is another major issue. This is coming down to, of course, user experience and content strategy. Um, this is the way that I find that a lot of arguments can be solved and, and even avoided, especially on teams that people are talking about, say, well, we need to have this information up here for guests, but how does the user access it? Um, how does it fit into a hierarchy? What can we do about it? How can we prove this and make it more guy clear to understand? I think back to some of the principles of UX I talked about earlier. Uh, this shows in here, is it usable and is it findable? Uh, this is a way at least of getting things visually in front of people. Instead of having a list, they see how things are going to be related to a site visually. It, it, you can even at times uh, it, uh, uncover some certain uh, it, issues you may have misconceptions about and being able to modify these things. Does it need to be in the primary navigation? Does the user really find that important? Sometimes you can find this out through analytics as well, but you can help actually get a lot of the experiences that users are going to have on site. You can get the information they need quickly. As far as comments, as I mentioned in my process, I start everything out on paper. You see here even there's some iterations on the forms here, coming back here, doing quick sketches up here that can be quickly validated. Uh, some of these can even be broken down to a paper prototype if need be. I make sure also with some of the format elements that uh, on my forms that I have here, that coming in here, that focusing, uh, say for example, in the top area up here, where are you going to be looking? What is the main desired focus that, that a user needs to accomplish on this? What is the goal of the page? Looking at it from an MVP standpoint for any aspect of the site. Uh, after that, moving to wireframes. I know especially today with a lot of uh, modern tool sets as a sketch or for those even who are starting with the more traditional methods like Photoshop, there may be a strong desire to go out here and start comping out. I would strongly advise against it. This helps out with not only UX but content strategy here and mapping out different regions. I'm careful to annotate this. It, it especially helps your members of your team and your stakeholders, yet it may not be that visual Having this out in front of them, showing them things, take for example, what I have marked out here in the desktop view, is something, uh, where is it coming in here? Is it above the fold? Is it below the fold? How, what is your information that you're looking at? By taking away uh, typographic elements, color, imagery, the main thing behind it this is you're having them focus on the key elements in the page when it comes down to the, the main interactions. It takes a lot of the other things out of focus, so you can, uh, so you can get down to the nitty gritty of dealing with the website, finding out its functionality before you add a lot of the uh, other features that are very difficult to change, so say it's like visual design. After that, when it comes down to actually working on the visual, I throw out a non-code. Uh, these are style tiles, this is something that Samantha Warren developed here. Uh, the main thing behind it is you can go ahead and buy in on the visual style, also without spending uh, an inordinate amount of time. Basically, if you're looking for imagery, uh, major elements, say, such as the header for home pages and landing pages, of the type of visual style you're looking for in typography. As you can see here, put on the style tile compared to even you know, the earlier visual comps, things were changing at this point. But because I'm using tools here, so for the most part here, I have used InDesign. Others can be used depending upon your choice or your workflow. I have things here that could actually be added and uh, it was easy to iterate on comps. And because things are already starting to get the feel of the site, you can get some buy-in. These can actually also be work very well into some uh, sort of non-code prototypes. Uh, this is what I was working on for interactive mocks, going off these. There's no code involved at this point, using Envision. Part of the challenge also when UXPA 2016 was, is our team was pretty distributed. For example, the conference organizer was based in Dallas and was traveling often. By using some of these Envision prototypes, for example, a lot of the assumptions can be validated. This was at an early stage in here, just going out here and looking at redesign conference program. Anything that you see here is completely interactive and works like a web application or a mobile site would work. That way we could be validating different assumptions getting a lot of uh, sort of arguments uh, and, and assumptions validated and or settled, sometimes even changed, before we even started working at Drupal itself. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I had in this project was also uh, for usability was table design. I've been working with conferences and events through my entire career, starting my job out of college with the trade association. 
nonetheless, I have never seen a more complex pricing scheme than I have for the UXDA International Show. Uh, this is showing here, of course, is that tables can often be difficult to point you on mobile devices. I looked at a number of solutions. One of them I found which worked pretty well was uh, Zurb Studio's responsive tables. There was actually a module for Drupal system that we used to, to incorporate the system. But again, coming out here and looking at a mobile first design, here you're looking at layouts that go from uh, desktop, tablet, to mobile. The good thing about it is, is it doesn't matter what the place the user is on, they can still access the same content. I went ahead and I kind of expanded and did on uh, Zurb's responsive tables, uh, adding my own custom with CSS to this here. As you can see here in the mobile device, even if somebody has never worked with responsive tables before, there's some of the rather subtle importance of, say, like using a little bit of drop shadow to show that this area is swipeable. In addition to that, there's actually a, a text, uh, there's a, actually some text to describe this for alert users. That's only shown during a mobile display. It's not relevant, of course, during tablet or desktop. The thing behind it is this, of course, and this is also shown during use of testing, is to make sure that you have something that your users can access the content regardless of their device. Uh, forms is another challenge. Oftentimes, this is sort of like the redhead and step shuffle with web design, and you look at a lot of uh, well-designed e-commerce sites. This is, I mean, there's a lot of careful detail that's placed in here. Uh, because we have a limited budget, we only had basically a two-person team working on the site. There wasn't an inordinate amount of time we spent on working on this, but uh, one of the things that I uh, found, of course, is coming out here and cleaning up some of the basic displays. Uh, we didn't want to reinvent the wheels. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the shopping cart experience here comes straight from stock or commerce. What I did there for the most part is going out here and just using a lot of style of CSS style, especially when it comes down to say radio buttons and select. Granted, when these elements were originally put into HTML, all the users did uh, were using uh, desktop devices, pointers such as mics. On um, mobile devices, though, you have to have a larger tap area. That wasn't accounted for at the time this was developed. Uh, looking out for a number of CSS tricks to go out here and handle with this, that's where I found this by careful experimentation and testing that it would actually have radiant selects and effect boxes that users would be able to select what they would need. Even if they had large fingers, were not exactly the best coordinated. Again, when it came back to readability, using subtle color fills, typography, and so. And as I mentioned in the past, it wasn't that we went ahead and redesigned the entire structures within Drupal or even Drupal Commerce. A lot of this came down to just careful use of CSS to take existing content and just style it in a way to make it more user friendly. Also, when it came down to the program, as I mentioned in the past, it was already said from the beginning there would be no printed program. This was going to be how users would be accessing it. For that reason, it needed to be performant. We looked at getting something as high performance as possible. Granted, oftentimes, as uh, I'm sure you all have well experienced, coming to a conference at times, even having some of the best uh, mobile devices uh, in the industry, uh, if you don't have very good uh, Wi-Fi coverage here, you're going to have an issue with performance bottlenecks. Uh, that had been discussed even for going out here and having, say, some pills as presenters. Part of the thing that I had raised, uh, raised though, at that point is, if they're going to be accessing the devices where uh, there's going to be a high uh, Wi-Fi uh, bandwidth hit, especially for the number of users trying to access content, this may create a challenge. For that reason, we basically stripped the main program to play within the group now to its bare essentials, having it well designed and readable. If you wanted to click and find out more about this, of course, you could click on the title or any part of the uh, of a program listing it, and we take you to that note. The main thing about it is just to have quick access, say, if you were going from one conference uh, event to another, to find out the information you needed as quickly as possible. In addition to layouts, um, I know at times I'll take a little bit more time to do with this, uh, deal with this. Sometimes they have to be redrawn quickly because they don't exist in digital. That wasn't the case here, at least the Western had a piece in digital art, which I cleaned up and adapted. This is all SVG, so it's resolution independent. Sometimes you may have a little bit of time that we take to prepare this, but I would say if it helps the users, which it does here, because readability is an issue, they can zoom up as the infinite level. It's a good thing to have. Um, when it comes down to user experience, it also comes down to staff administration. I know oftentimes some of those stock displays in the Drupal and granted, it's been improved significantly in D8 over D7, but still nonetheless, we have enough of our state administrators who would be working with are not tech savvy at all. 
not to mention then you have the Drupal experience. That's why I also worked uh, together with my uh, developer partner right, going after and improving the experience here. Um, it employs responsive tables. Also, when it comes down to search fields, a lot of the drop select items have also been improved for touch experience, so they need to access on a mobile device. And having the fields that they would most need to go after and search by, uh, say if they needed to um, add users to search from the optional program or check registration while on site. As far as the takeaways for USB 2016, uh, from what we found at the registration, was, and we, uh, from what we have heard that it was helped by an improved user experience, uh, we had worked on doing uh, the mobile experience. Uh, there were through challenges in UX 2015. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had learned from it and adapted. And also, there was improved integration to surveys and presentations, which are needed, of course, to go out and build future events. And uh, the staff functionality was also greatly appreciated. Again, coming back to my process, that's what I'm saying is you have to have empathy for all project members. That includes some of them we normally don't think about, such as site administrators. And of course, uh, managing a conference in and of itself is challenging enough by itself. You don't need to be challenged by making difficult administrative processes to add to that. Uh, another project example that Kirsten is going to be talking about here is the Department of Commerce. And Kirsten, if you want to talk about this. Thanks. So. So one of the things that we did was we took a look at how government agencies were using the same kind of design thinking to, to do iterations or beta tests and that sort of thing. So the, the first one we're going to look at is the Department of Commerce, and then we'll look very quickly at mine because we're already over time. And I know at least one of you is a speaker next. So Department of Commerce. This is the original commerce site that was redesigned in late 2015. This was the new um, commerce beta site. So when they went beta, they actually had the original up at the same time that they had their beta site up. And what they did was they created these, we'll call them pop-up blocks, to provide information about each of the individual elements on the page. And you'll, what you're gonna notice in the next slide is that these things also change. So based on the feedback that they received, they actually requested feedback from users. They determined that they needed different types of styles or less styles. They determined that um, some of the things that the stakeholders wanted, like images on the front and lots of video, users didn't care about. So they were able to put them down towards the bottom instead. So here's another example of how they, they did it. The next iteration allowed people to take tour of the site they started moving things down and pushing things up. Like here, they provided information on specific events that were happening. And you'll notice here, they even changed out the data. And they discovered at this point, again, users didn't care about the images or the videos. Now they've actually dropped off the fold. People were coming to the site to find very specific information, like data. They were coming here to get more information from their um, documents and archives. They were really trying to learn about commerce and find out when, when the events were happening. And no one was clicking any of the pictures. So they just moved them off the, the top fold of the page. So some of the, obviously the takeaways are they changed their uh, graphing and their social icons. They created new icons and some um, overlays for users to be able to navigate. And then they moved a bunch of things off the top fold. So now my example. So we just launched our new site. This is the blog for the State Department. And part of what we discovered is that we had a lot of functionality that was no longer valid. We were using um, RSS feeds from Adam. We needed another RSS feed. So Instead of that, we decided to create a new subscription function. We use GovDelivery, which is now Granicus. That just happened like last week. So we wanted users to be able to sign up for information because what we found was they really only care about the content. And they don't care at all about the images. We were an image-heavy site, so it's a pretty, pretty big database for um, lots of reasons that I 
would love to go into, but we don't have enough time. Another thing is, is our previous um, site search didn't work at all. At all. At some point, it had broken. The JavaScript was the issue, and we were not able to fix it. So when we decided to do a new site, we looked for how our, our users were, were finding us and getting information about us by creating the personas that um, Carl had talked about earlier. We did lots of interviews, we talked to users, and then we actually used the analytics as well to determine these things. And on top of it, I had Carl come in and talk to our team so that they understood what we were thinking behind the design of everything. So another one of the things that we discovered is that we have lots of video content. Um, Department of State provides it through um, DOD, through our YouTube channel. We also have Brightco videos. We provided, at least during the Obama administration, a daily press briefing, which was the most accessed videos we had. They were accessed all the time. So in order for us to be able to provide all of that kind of content, we wanted a way for users to be able to access it as if we were doing it live. So this field here, which we haven't actually pushed up to the front, I'll show you that in a second, um, is a constant on the site, it never goes any, anywhere. But anytime we have a live event, it's gonna be right there. Um, and we will also be doing a live event, sort of a broadcast at the top. So once we actually do start doing those again, because again, administration change, we will actually have a bar up here that comes across and says, hey, there's a live event. And that live event piece will actually go back up to here. We really looked at how our users were trying to interact with us and how we got the message out to them. The next thing that you'll notice is that this is a really, we'll call it a busy site. Again, it's pretty image, image heavy, but one of the things that we learned from our experience is that, and from the personas, is that most people won't click on the pictures. Now, our, our need was to meet the political need of the people who actually like to look at the pictures. But on a mobile device, we don't use that. And most of our users actually were coming and clicking links, not images. So we needed to provide a different experience for them. And to do that, we did this. So normally you get like the hero image on most of your, your mobile devices, and you saw that with the USPA stuff. We actually did it in, in an opposite way. We knew that our users were on mobile devices that were broadband um, iffy, we'll call it iffy. We have a lot of users who come to our site who are using Opera Mini, which is pretty much a Java, JavaScript free environment. So how do we give them the content they're looking for without having to use JavaScript? We decided we would use text. So we put the text up front so that our users could access the content that they were looking for. And then we put the images at the bottom for the other users who might still want to see an image. In addition to that, anytime that we have a video, this field here can also be a video. Because again, somehow our videos are very popular. So that was how we redesigned our site. And again, we used personas to do this. We um, tested a lot of this with internal customers. We have what's called a sneak preview function. So any of our individual nodes that we have stories for, we can forward to the, eight, the part of the agency who's looking for that information and have them approve their content before we even post it. So it's a lot more interactive, a lot more complex than our previous site. And we also dropped all of our mapping function. So we got a lot of um, availability of, call it bandwidth, um, because we actually dropped a lot of functionality that just wasn't being used any longer. So this is sort of like my take on this, is you really have to, to be a user advocate as a developer, because I'm not a designer. I had Carl come in and do these things for us because I'm not a designer. What, I like to suggest is that you really should think about being a user advocate and I, I recommend this to every government agency and every government employee I talk to. Carl, do you want to go over this real quick because uh, we need to wrap it up in about 30 seconds. Alright, like 
I'd say that when personally come into, I mean, the main thing, of course, is coming out here thinking of benefits. Um, that's why it's just going out here using MVP wherever you can. If it becomes down to paper, as I mentioned, even on some of the projects I work on, like some of the larger application flights working at KMA, I've even gone out here and even at the happy hour when we have some stakeholders, even if it came down to frame with a pen on a bar napkin, you could actually get things validated pretty quickly. Um, I think the main thing, of course, uh, behind that is looking at your users, looking at user flow, even having a percent, even if it's something positive, that you can just come in here and have something that you can work on to advocate as quickly as possible. Uh, as far as building support, um, I'm into that is uh, I think you need to involve stakeholders and start and, uh, and, and get them in as well as much as possible. I mean, if you can't, even if it has to be with posting printouts, if you work, anything that keeps them involved in the process and lets them know what's going on. Also, if you're looking at doing this in-house, especially if you're on a small team, if you don't have a lot of user user advocacy built up in your organization, that's when you can add your deep enough success stories like the one person had just talked about. It helps strengthen your case. When you actually have actionable content, especially if you have success stories that you have some of your users to talk about, that's when you can uh, work on getting this together. Also, external success stories, uh, even if it comes down from major organizations, say such as Apple or Airbnb, can help your case. Um, that's where it comes back to again, uh, making others aware of the process. It helps raise your standing. Um, there are also government uh, initiatives such as USDS, EKF, and granted, of course, change in administration. Some things may be changing on that, but there are plenty of UX resources you can have that are outside the government. And the main thing takeaway that will come down to is emphasize that what helps the user helps you. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, Sorry, no, we're going to have to go because we don't have much time. So I'm going to give you our okay. information, and this is available obviously through the site, and um, it's been recorded, so you could actually see the slides that we weren't able to get to, which is just the additional reading, and um, some organizations to look at for this kind of work. And if you would like to reach out to us, uh, Carl and I are always happy to answer questions, and um, easily accessible. And if you can't find us through um, Twitter, because we're both pretty prolific twi tweeters. Um, just reach out to us by email. Any questions before they start coming in? Because I think we have like one minute before the next session. Okay. Thanks, Carl.